Thank you. <laughs> and then my son Caleb is here. Stand up, Caleb. And I can barely go um, get through a teaching, a preaching, uh, a training session without actually talking about my son because I've, I've been privileged with the opportunity to serve and, and run alongside and glean from some of the generals in the prayer movement, prophetic movement, um, Cindy Jacobs and Dutch Sheets and many, many others, and Mama Mary Jo Pierce, love you so much. She's a mama to me too. Um, but I always say that my most intense um, school of prayer and boot camp and intercession was praying for that boy right there. So he's an absolute miracle, and I'm gonna actually start by talking about him. So, Caleb, strap yourself in. <laughs> so, he really is a miracle. He's our, our one and only child, our miracle baby. We weren't supposed to have any. Um, and, um, but Caleb, um, so he was born with these congenital heart defects. And I thought I was going to have, you know, a, I was told I was having a 100%, you know, healthy baby and everything was perfectly normal and totally okay. And then he was born and long story short, I'm not going to give all the details, but a couple of weeks into him being born, um, uh, and this was our only child struggled with infertility, have had, we've got five babies in heaven. And, um, but finally, finally, we've got our baby. Finally, we've got our miracle. And, um, and just three weeks into him being alive, um, Holy Spirit just led me to take him back to the doctor and check some things out that I just did not have a peace with, even as a, you know, first time mom. Um, and it turns out that he had congenital heart defects, holes in his heart. His aorta was almost pin pinched closed, had no oxygenated blood to his entire lower body. So anyway, the doctors found all of this after doing all of these tests. And they say, we don't know how your son is alive right now. And had you waited even one more day, he probably would not have survived. And um, they said, you can't take him home. We've got to put him in for emergency open heart surgery. And, um, you know, and, and, and gave us the worst prognosis ever, right? And, um, and you know, that he would um, need a pace of it. Even if, if, if he survived the surgery and everything went okay, then he would need a pacemaker and he'd have... Um, uh, limited um, exposure to the sun and he couldn't play sports and exert himself and he'd need a pacemaker and because of lack of oxygenated blood he'd have low muscle tone and weakness in his legs and on and on and on I mean so many things they even told us he may never speak because where they had to cut open you know that's where the uh, nerves run that control the vocal cords and they gave us the worst prognosis and they said okay so we're taking him we're gonna go put him set him up in a room in the hospital and um, the hospital was just like across the bridge from the doctor's offices they said we're we're gonna set him up there. We'll give you some time for you to figure out who you're gonna call, who's gonna stay with him in the hospital during all of these surgeries that he needs to have and, um, and left us there. And I was absolutely a mess. And um, I, I was a mess. And I just, I mean, I fell apart just weeping and crying before the Lord just crying out to him like, how in the world, like what is going on? And I'm there just crying and weeping and just in disbelief, in total and utter shock. And in the middle of that despair, we're inside um, like a waiting room, an office, like a private waiting room in the cardiologist's office. And I, ju I just feel like, you know, that pause in the spirit. And, and my attention was drawn to the side wall. And on the side wall... So this medical practice, they were all believers, they were Christians. And on this side wall of that room, there's this big, huge portrait on the wall. And it was a portrait in a pediatric cardiologist's office. Okay? It's a portrait of a Roman soldier, fully dressed in armor. And every part of the armor had a little fine line with the scripture citation in it from Ephesians chapter six, the armor of God. And in that moment, I heard the voice of the Lord say to me, I've given you everything you need to get through this. Now march on, march on in strength. And we walked through the journey. By the age of 11, he had 12 surgeries. He's 14 now. He's an absolute miracle. Never had problem with his muscle tones. We have, he's never needed a pacemaker. He's played all the sports. He's, I mean, everything that the doctors told us 
has never ever been a limitation in his life. We have multiple medically documented miracles of blood pressure normalizing just by prayer and his aorta opening up and blood flowing just by prayer and all these different things. So it's been just an amazing journey with the Lord of seeing him work both in partnership with the medical community, but also just the supernatural, just absolute miracles. So fast forward to a couple years later, I was pre preparing to speak for a women's uh, conference in Brooklyn, New York. That's where I'm originally from. Um, so I was, I was living here in Dallas, but preparing to speak for a conference back in New York. And as I was, and, and they asked me to speak about Deborah. And as I was preparing to speak for this conference and I'm combing through Judges chapter four and five and the whole story of Deborah, I come upon those words. When Deborah was in the midst of battle facing the overwhelming odds stacked against her that she, out of her, from her innermost being, from the depths of her soul, came out these words, oh my soul, march on, march on in strength. And you know the story, Deborah was this prophet and judge and leader over the nation of Israel, over a people that had been weakened by oppression for over 20 years. And there was violence in the land to the point where village life had ceased. They couldn't dream. There was no joy. They couldn't celebrate. There was no community. There was high idolatry in the land. And not, not only was there spiritual warfare and darkness and oppression to contend against every single day, but now in the natural too, Deborah said, war was at the gate. And the enemy army, they had over 900 iron chariots and tens of thousands of foot soldiers and an arsenal full of weapons. Meanwhile, Deborah's people had been stripped of their weaponry. Not a sword or a spear was found in their land, so they had nothing to fight back with. They were helpless and without hope. And now they were in the midst of their enemies, right? War was at the gates, but Deborah was awakened. In the midst of all of that, she awakened. You know, sometimes you're in so much, you're under so much pressure. You're undergoing such a difficult circumstance that you feel like you are just asleep, like you're in a coma to everything else around you. Sometimes even to the presence of God and the very hand of God at work in your favor. But in the midst of all of this, it says that Deborah was awakened and then Deborah arose and by the power of the Holy Spirit upon her, Deborah marched on in strength, strength in the face of battle. So Deborah was awakened and Deborah arose as a mother, she arose in Israel. So what did Deborah awaken to that empowered her to arise and march on in strength? First, she awakened. I think I just heard the voice of, was that my pastor? These lights are like, I can't see. Pastor Becky Hennessy. That's what, this is my home church. And I, oh, and Pastor Jim. <laughs> this is my home church. This is our home church. Trinity Church, we serve as the prayer pastors here, and we just have just the most amazing, amazing pastors and leaders, and I'm honored to serve under them and even have them here today. So Deborah awakened to her identity. She awakened to her identity as God's gatekeeper and culture shifter. You know that in scripture, in the New Testament, every time you see the word church, it's translated one of two ways. Either the word oikos, which means the family of God, community, the sheepfold, the household of God. But more often than not, it's actually translated as the word ecclesia. Now the word ecclesia, they were this body of called out ones. They were elders in the city. And in that day, they had like walled cities. So they would call them out whenever they were needed to gather at the gates of a city. And there at the gates, they would decide legal matters. They would set in place the laws. They would decide, determine what was permissible within that city and what could not be. What and who could enter there. They were the gatekeepers. And you know that you and I are still gatekeepers today. Not only to keep things out, but also gatekeepers. Hey, for the glory of God, the king of glory to come in. So to the Romans, the ecclesia, they were also the culture shifters. So the Romans, the ecclesia, they would go into a city, conquer a city, and, and then they would begin to change everything up within that city or within that region. They'd shift the education system and the literature, the economic system, the currency, the food, the art, the, the holidays, the dress, the celebrations, the architecture, all of those things so that everywhere that you looked, it looked like Rome. 
And we are still commissioned as culture shifters today so that everywhere that you go, you shift. You shift the atmosphere. You shift the culture. Come on, so that everywhere that the people look, it looks like heaven. And Deborah nearly took on this role. I mean, she took this role on seriously. And she would go and she would sit out in the countryside under the palm of Deborah located between Ramah, which represented the high place of idolatry, and Bethel, which represented the, the house of God. And she served as a watchman. She she served as a gatekeeper. She stood in the gap and she formed the shield against the idolatry of Rama. And there out in the country under the palm tree of Deborah, it says that she, she would sit there and adjudicate justice. She was God's legislative assembly on the earth. Right from that seat, she was shifting culture and she was saying the idolatry of Rama, you hear and no further. Come on, not on my watch. Come on, not in my territory. And she was a keeper there at that gate. And in God's wisdom, she influenced and shaped the culture, causing the hearts of the people to stay close to God and far away from the idolatry that was constantly knocking at their door. She became a shield of protection for her people, saying, here and no further. Come on, right here I draw the line, not on my watch. I'm not going to allow it. I'm going to rise up and protect my people. And you have also been strategically placed by God as a gatekeeper and a culture shifter. We have delegated authority just like Deborah did to operate as prophetic rulers over our homes, come on, over our workplaces, over our community and our family and our schools, your church, your city, you're God's governing legislative assembly, culture creators on the earth where you have the authority to determine, come on, by your decrees, your prophetic decrees, what is permissible here and what cannot be in whatever area of influence God's placed you. You know, and some might say, oh, that sounds a little too aggressive for me. And you're like, I'm all about intimacy and loving my king and pursuing my peace. I'm a lover, not a fighter. And if you know me, if you know this little firecracker well, you know that that's my source. It's a secret place of intimacy with Jesus, my king. But some of us say, oh, I'm only a lover and I'm not a fighter. I'm a virtuous woman, right? I'm not a warring woman. And yes, that's all good. But in, I want to remind you that in Ephesians 5, we are referred to as a bride of Christ. Continue reading into Ephesians 6 and Holy Spirit. Come on. That's what Holy Spirit highlighted to me that day, right? That I learned that my son's life was at stake. And in Ephesians 6, it describes the armor of God and encourages us to clothe ourselves daily with the armor of God to be infused by the power of the Holy Spirit, clothing ourselves with that armor.